Okay, and we're going to be in John 17 exclusively for the whole day here. It's the high priestly prayer of Jesus, um, John 17, 1 through 26. And I'm going to read those verses to you, and then we're going to jump in and, and dig in and see what God has in store for us there. So if you want to follow along, there are Bibles in the chairs. Otherwise, on the Welcome Center, there's Bibles, iPhone, iPad, whatever you got, to Android. Um, you can use iVersion, or version is a good Bible version if you need a digital copy to keep track of what we're reading. And there it reads in John 17. It says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. And he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your, pres- in your own presence with the, glory that I had, th- with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me. And they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I have, I have kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except for the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world." I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, and they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. It's a lengthy passage, but a fabulous passage, right? And sometimes as a pastor, you reach a passage of Scripture. uh, You know, I've been preaching through the book of John. And and sometimes you you reach these places kind of like today where you kind of find yourself wondering, how am I going to preach this, right? Um, Something this is really, truly, amazingly glorious. Something this, this wonderful, something this, this chock full of information and details, right? How do, I, how do I adequately do it in a way that will fully feature the goodness and the love of God? Um, it, it's a humbling process, preaching. It really, truly is. And I've tried my best to hopefully help you see the greatness of God in this message today. This passage is often referred to as the high priestly prayer. And, and it brings to mind for us something of the picture of, uh, of those Old Testament, those, those high priests, as they would go into the, the most holy place. And as they would do that, these priests would take with them uh, the names of the tribes of Israel, the, the names of the children of God. They'd take with them uh, the names of the people of God and then would go into this high holy 
place and, and there meet with God as, his inter, as, as the intercessor to God for the people. And they would, they would pray on the people's behalf, interceding on their behalf, bringing their sacrifices on their behalf. That was the job of the priest. And, and so that's kind of the backdrop idea of what's going on here. And as we, as we read this then, uh, we, we kind of get this little window into the mind and prayer life of Jesus that corresponds with that. Um, what we're doing here is we're, we're, we're listening in uh, on, on a prayer of Jesus, a prayer of Jesus to God. We're, we're eavesdropping, so to speak, on his prayer. We're, we're overhearing him pray, right? And, and as, I, as I read things like this, of course, this is a prayer between Jesus and the Father God. And John has recorded it for us, and we have it here in Scripture. Have you, you ever wondered, well, I mean, did, was John, like, sitting on the side taking notes? Right? I mean, that's a, you heard me read that. I couldn't remember that if my life depended on it. You know, word for word, certainly. Now, this is, of course, where the Holy Spirit comes in and the transmission of the gospel and the creation of the Bible and, 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 and all those sorts of things. And, and thankfully, however God worked that out with the Holy Spirit through, through the Apostle John, that John was able to, to capture this intimate moment of, of Jesus in relationship, praying to God the Father. Um, I, I've, I've often wondered, you know, about as I read my Bible and... and, and this Bible I have here isn't one of them, but I have some Bibles that are red-letter Bibles, right? And you know what those are, where the words of Jesus are in red, right? And, and, and as I've, I've studied those for many, many years, and I've always wondered, like, wow, how, how did they capture that? And, and, and what else did Jesus say? Because we know, I mean, obviously, that's just like a little tiny bit of what Jesus had to say. Uh, there's lots of things that he said that, that were never captured. And so I, I, I'm the kind of weird cat that's kind of curious about those kinds of things. And, and it just, I, I find, that stuff, find that stuff interesting. And, and, and uh, I don't try to speculate too much because we don't have information, but it, but it is interesting nonetheless. And one of the things I've always wondered about is, you know, we, we hear these prayers of Jesus. We've got a couple of prayers of Jesus, but I'm sure he prayed an awful lot. And I, and I wonder, like, like what, was, what was his prayer language? How did he pray? You know, because the other day I was listening to somebody pray. Um, and, and you may be one of these people, I, I don't mean this as a judgment, but some, some people use the word Lord like 77 times every time they pray. Like, Lord Jesus, Lord, 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 Lord. I mean, this is like, okay. And, and that's good because he's Lord. And, and again, I'm not making fun of you in that. Um, but, but some people have things that they use like that. And it's a, it's a thing that, that, that's a pause to, to get to the next thought. And, and so I'm sure I have things like that. And, and uh, how did Jesus pray? You know, what, what was his prayer life like? Because we have lots of information about lots of things, but we only have a couple of his prayers to go on. And so when we get this, we get Jesus' prayer language here. We get a, a little bit of a glimpse into what his prayer life was like. And, and as I said, I don't know how John got all of that, but we know that John did it through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the Word of God, and it's accurate, and it's true, and I'm thankful that we've been given it. And, and so we have this great, great prayer of Jesus. Now, if you've looked and you're following along in your Bible, you'll see that this chapter falls into kind of three different, pretty clear, pretty distinct segments. It's, you know, basically verses 1 to 5, uh, Jesus is praying for himself, right? And then in verses 6 through 19, Jesus is praying for his disciples. Now it's the 11 at this point. It's not the 12 anymore. It's the 11. Judas Iscariot's been, you know, taken off to do his thing. And so it's the 11. So Jesus is praying for those disciples. And then in verses 20 through 26, Jesus prays for the people of God everywhere and at all times, which includes, of course, you and me. Now, Simply spoken, we, we could take those three segments, we could jump in there. I could probably do a week in each one of those segments. I'm not going to. Um, but, but as I read through this and as I did my studies for this and my planning for this, uh, I kept coming back to this one verse out of all of that that I just read. Uh, this, this one verse, uh, verse 24. And that's kind of going to be the focus of our sermon today. It, because in, in many ways, verse 24 kind of, uh, is what you might call an epitomizing text, right? It's, it's, it's kind of this encapsulates so much of what's being said there. And what it says in verse 24 again, it says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me 
before the foundation of the world. So first from this, what I want you to see is the, the foundation from which Christ prays for all of his people. The very first part of that basis Christ is praying for all of us is that Jesus is fully conscious of his role as a divine mediator. He knows who he has been given, right? It says that. He knows who he calls his own. There's a, a certainty to that, that that Jesus has here as to who are his people, a certainty that, that only, only God could possess. And, and, and as we read this prayer, hopefully you, you caught, you heard something, uh, a little bit of the, the splendor of Jesus' deity that seems to shine forth in this passage because of the words that he chooses and uses. He seems fully conscious here that, 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 that he is fully God, right? Father, glorify your son, he says. Glorify your son. That's how he begins the prayer way back in, in verse 1. He's the son of God. He's the, the Lord of glory. He, he, he is the word incarnate. He is the eternal son of God. He is, he is glorious for all times and in all things. He's been there since the beginning and will be there in the end. The one that says, you have loved me since the foundation of the earth, since the foundation of the world. He's conscious of an existence that was started before the earth, right? That he's been since before time was created. And so on that basis, he seems to kind of bring forth now this, this prayer on behalf of his disciples and on behalf of us as well, out of this consciousness of, of who he fully is that he is the second person of the Trinity, that he's the divine Lord, that he is the Messiah. And how, just how reassuring must it have been for Jesus on those occasions where God spoke directly to him, right? As, as he's here on earth living and walking among the people of earth, he's, he's, he's in some ways, shapes, or forms uh, chosen, to limit his powers. He doesn't constantly run around. Not every single person who's ill gets healed and all sorts of things like that that he has the power to do, but doesn't. But he's here on earth, and, and while he's here, God speaks directly to him, at least on a couple of occasions that we know of. And in the first one, of course, we remember back at the Jordan River, right? Jesus is getting baptized. He's, he's being set apart, commissioned for the task that laid before him. This is kind of the entry point, the beginning of his public ministry. And, and, and we see, you know, John's baptizing him and a voice comes from heaven and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, right? I love him. I, I listen to him. And I listen to him because I love him, basically, is what God is saying. And then the, the second one that we know of, of course, is on, Mount Trans, on the Mount of Transfiguration that, you know, John and Peter are there. Most of the disciples aren't, but John and Peter are there. And again, this, this voice comes from heaven and says, this is my son in whom I love. I love him. And how reassuring must it have been for Jesus in those kind of two pinnacle moments of his life and ministry, in the fulfillment of, of his redemptive ministry, to be reminded that despite what may be coming, right at the very beginning of his ministry and right towards the end of his ministry, despite whatever's going to happen, Jesus, Father God says, I love you. Jesus, I love you. And, and this is on the verge, this passage of Jesus going to the cross, right? On the very verge of going to the Garden of Gethsemane. On the very verge of climbing the hill of Calvary. Within hours, the beginning of his crucifixion will happen. It's already actually partly underway because, as I said, Judas Iscariot's already left the building. Within hours... Darkness and destruction will come, descend upon him. Darkness will begin to envelop him. And in that moment, he's reminded of his father's love. When Jesus is staring down the beginning of his own crucifixion, it is in that very moment that he's praying in the assurance that his father God loves him. 
And it's interesting what Jesus says here. He prays in verse 24. He says, for those whom you have given me. If you heard, that's a phrase that kind of repeated itself, right? A few times as I, as I read this chapter. Um, it starts in verse 2 where he says that, and then in verse 6, and then in verse 9, and four different times we have that. That Jesus makes this prayer on behalf of those whom the Father has given to him. Those who were given to him before the foundation of the earth. He's not praying for the whole world. He's not praying for all of humanity at this point. But he's praying for those whom God has given to him. This is a prayer on behalf of those whom the Father had gifted to the Son in the covenant of redemption. As I said, this is a phrase that we've kind of heard before. Um, in chapter 6, verses 37 through 39, it says there that all that the Father gives to me will come to me. And back in chapter 10, I preached through that, when Jesus speaks of his sheep, he's saying, no one is able to snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. And who are they exactly? Well, there's two different groups of people. One group, as I mentioned, comes in, in verses, 16, or verses 6 through 19, and that group is the disciples. The, the 11, as I said, because Judas Iscariot's gone, it's no longer 12, it's 11 disciples. And Jesus is praying for them. He's praying for these guys who've been following him. He knows what's to come for them. And they've been gifted to him. They've been given to him. But then, in the next section of this passage, he's praying for a broader group, a wider group. He's kind of expanding. He starts praying for himself, then his disciples, and then he throws his arms open, right? He's praying for this much larger circle as well. He's not praying just for the disciples. And he says, I do not ask, I do not ask in behalf of these alone, in verse 20, but for those who believe in me through their words, right? Did you hear that? This applies to each and every one of us. Jesus is praying for those who will come to faith through the ministry of the disciples. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul, all these other guys, right? Men who will go out and, and preach the gospel, and they'll teach the gospel, and they'll witness about Jesus Christ. And through them, by the power of the Holy Spirit, others will come to know Jesus Christ. They'll come to know God from... Every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. That is God's intent, and that is God's plan, right? And when we share our faith with others, when we share about Christ with others in our lives, we get to be part of that very team. We are in line with the disciples, spiritually speaking, in doing the work that, that Jesus is praying for here. When you share your faith, you are fulfilling the final prayer and petition that we have recorded of Jesus. That's what you're doing as you share your faith. And God will bless that. And God will use your testimony, use your story, use your sharing of the good news of the gospel. God will use that gift that he's given to you and he'll bless it. And God can take that and cause that seed to grow in the hearts and lives of others. Because here's the deal. Through us, through you, God is accomplishing his great task of gathering his people. And all of us have some responsibility for that. There's all sorts of turmoil in the world right now. All sorts of things going on. All sorts of unknown. All sorts of fear, right? How many of you wish you would have taken your money out of stock about a week ago? Amen. <laughs> right? I thought about it on Friday. I did it on Monday, and it cost me about 20%. Now, I'm not living in fear of that. But think of this. How many gods of this world did God take down this week? NBA, NFL, NHL, golf, tennis, every sport, high school sport, college sport, NCAA tournament. It's March Madness. I'm going to go through withdrawal. 
What am I going to do when I can't watch March Madness? Financial institutions, stock. How many people have put their hope in their bank account? All sorts of things. How many people have put their hope in their health? How many people have put their hope in their education? That's being shut down right now, too. The gods of this world have met their match this week, I do believe. And our God is still in control, despite whatever may come. I believe that absolutely and fully. And it's in moments like this, where naturally we have one of two responses as humans. It's fight or flight. I tell you what, I'm not running. I don't think Jesus is running. I don't think the gospel is running. And so I'm going to stay and fight. I'm going to stay and share. I'm going to stay in love. I'm going to find ways in the days and weeks to come to love my neighbor. Because in their fear, maybe their heart's a little more open to the good news of Jesus. When they look at their bank account and they find themselves depressed, maybe they need a little good news and a little bit of hope. When, they, when somebody they know maybe gets sick, maybe they're going to need some assurance, a place to turn to. And Jesus has equipped us and called us for that very purpose. And he prayed for us. Prayed for us for times even such as this. It says, each and every one of us is an agent of the gospel. Each and every one of us has been equipped and given, even when we feel inadequate. I understand that. We're not all great speakers. We're not all perfect at sharing the gospel. But if Jesus loves you and the love of Jesus is in your heart, that is enough. He's prayed for you. Be faithful. And he will see you through it. So as we leave in a little bit, there's a lot of fear out there. Go out and be the hope and be the love. Be prepared to love your neighbor and share the gospel. Maybe from six feet away, but be prepared to do it. And know that Jesus has already prayed for you in it. Okay, now back to my sermon. That was your bonus content for the day. Back to my sermon about Jesus' prayer. What effect should Jesus' prayer have on his people, us, followers? Well, three things kind of came to mind as I read through this this week. And the first thing, it should prompt humility in us, right? Those of us who believe are the Father's gift of love to his Son. Remember, <laughs> I thought about this this week. Remember when you used to make stuff for your mom for Mother's Day at school? Yeah? Remember that high-quality art you came up with? Or how many of you made your mom an ashtray? <laughs> how many of you made an ashtray for a mom who doesn't smoke? Yeah? Yeah, right? We did stuff like that. Now, times have changed, of course. But we did stuff like that. And when your mom got it, she was like, this is an amazing piece of art. Let me put it on the fridge, right? And it stayed there, and she was proud of it, and, and she was thankful for what you had given her. Or if you made her breakfast in bed and it was burnt cornflakes and spilled milk or whatever it was, right? She was thankful. And God has given to Jesus us as a gift to his son. And he's, he's, he's saying, I love you and I'm going to give you these people and through you and, and, and through your ministry and through the accomplishment of redemption that, that you, Jesus, will provide on, be, on my behalf to these people, you will then bring them back to me. And so it should, should humble us, frankly, that as sinful and sin-filled people, we have been given as a gift to Jesus. And I don't care how bad a mess your life is, he'll take you. Just like no matter how bad your art was, your mom took it, right? Jesus takes us, each and every one of us, if our hope 
and trust is in him. And Jesus not only takes us, but as our mothers did, he receives us with joy. And so that should provoke a little bit of humility in us, that he would be so willing to accept us, even in our mess. He loves you, and he loves me. Look again at verse 24. It says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. With Jesus. Where he is. It reminds us actually of an earlier passage from the time in the upper room where Jesus says, in my father's house there are many rooms, right? Or mansions. And I go there to prepare a place for you. And I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may also be, right? Where I am, there you may also be. Where is heaven? You ever had that question? I had a kid in my last church who had more questions than anybody on the planet. Which was awesome. And about once a week, he or his mom would send me a little email and a text. It depended on, on his age, because I was his pastor for eight years, and so I got to kind of see him and shepherd him from junior high all the way into high school. Or, well, from elementary all the way into high school, for that matter. And so I would get these questions. And one of the questions was, where is heaven? Well, it's not like you can poke a pin on a map and say it's there. Heaven is simply where Jesus is. And that's where he desires for us to be, is to be with him. Absent from the body and present with the Lord, right? And then what does he mean when he prays that they may be with me where I am? Well, let me suggest a couple of thoughts along those lines. As he's praying this, I think one of the things he is praying for within this is he's praying for our sanctification. That justification is when you become a Christian, like that. Now you're a Christian, you've given your life to Jesus, he's your hope, he's your savior. But sanctification is that lifelong, ongoing process of hopefully becoming more and more Christ-like. And I think that's kind of what he's angling at here. It's not specifically laid out in this verse 24 particularly, but, but follow the logic with me for just a second because it's in the rest of the prayer. The logic is that if we are going to be with Jesus, we can't be there with our sins, right? Sin cannot go into a perfect heaven. And, and that's why Jesus prays, sanctify them back in verse 17. And so Jesus is not only praying that we would love others and share the good news of the gospel with others, but he's, he's praying for our spiritual development as well. Sanctify them in truth, he says. Your word, God, is truth. And his prayer is that even today, that through the scriptures, through the reading of the word of God, through his Holy Spirit, who has caused it to be written down in, in perfect form, that we might be sanctified through reading it and through studying it and through spending time in his word, that it might make us more and more holy, that it might be used to keep us from the influence of the world. That is part of what Jesus is praying for. And also part of that prayer is that he's leaving the world, but he knows the disciples are going to be left behind, right? And he's not praying that God would somehow take them up and out of the world, but that his Father in heaven would keep them from the evil one. So he's praying that we'd share the gospel, he's praying that we'd grow in the gospel, and he's praying for our spiritual protection. Remember Peter. Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat. But then he says, but I have prayed for you. So Jesus prays for our sanctification. He prays that we might be made more and more holy. You and me, each and every one of us. What do you pray for Jesus? I pray for my people that they might be more like me. He wants us to be holy. He wants us to grow in grace and knowledge of God. He wants us to be different from the world. He wants us to persevere. He says, I'm going to go away, right? 
I'm coming to you, my father, but I'm leaving these guys behind. I'm leaving, leaving these people behind. I'm leaving behind those whom you have given me in this world, and I want them to be with me. I want every single one of them to be with me. See, he knew trouble lies ahead. He, Jesus knew difficulties were going to come. And it's through the many trials and tribulations of life that we enter into the kingdom of God. But, but Jesus is saying, I want you to keep each and every one of them through those times. Through times even like today, where there's fear and worry in the world. Jesus is praying for you and for me. That we would run the race well, that we would endure, that we would per, that we'd pursue it with perseverance until he calls us home on that final day. And he wants each and every one of us to be there with him. He prays for you and for me. Did you know that? He does. That's what Jesus prays for. That we might be with him, that we might be holy, that we might share his love, and that we might see it through to the very end. I'll close with just one more thought. Because there's one other thing that he has in this prayer. He says that they may be with me where I am in order that they might behold my glory. Every now and then through the, the ministry of Jesus, the incarnate Jesus, his glory shone through just a little bit, right? We see it in the miracles as he performs them. It says in, in John chapter 2, Back, you remember the wedding? And he's turning water into wine. It says, he manifested forth his glory. And in this part of the story, in just a few short hours, the disciples would be unable to see any of his glory, right? If they were to look upon Jesus a few hours from this point in which he's praying this prayer, what are they going to see? They're going to see a disheveled, destroyed human being. They would see the one on whom the world would spit upon and mock and scourge, nailed to a cross and crucified. And any glory that was his, and those moments before he goes to the cross and while he's on the cross, were going to be hidden. And in this moment he's praying, I want them to see me for who I really am, for truly who I am. I want them to see me in my glory, in my splendor. See me for who I truly am. Full of unimaginable brilliance and beauty is what Jesus is calling us to. See him as perfectly God and perfectly man at all times throughout beginning and end. That he is with God the Father and as fully God. Fully in perfect relationship with Father, Son, and Spirit in one. All of the glory and all of the splendor. That's one of the things that Jesus also wants us to see. That we might catch, even in dark times, a little glimpse of his glory. I don't know what's on your agenda for the next couple of weeks. Our schedules have all, it's like we took our papers and went, Bleh, right? We'll figure it out as they float back down to the table. But I know that despite whatever comes, Jesus wants you to see his glory. He wants you to put your hope and trust in him and nothing else. And that is what God has been preparing for us. And that is what Jesus has been praying for us. And so shouldn't we right now be preparing ourselves for that as well? If you find yourself with a few spare minutes this week, a little bit of time to ponder this, a little time to think deeply on these prayers of Jesus. Cherish his love for you. Give him thanks and praise. Feel honored by it and feel humbled by it. And then take it and share it with the world. Be a hope and be a light into the world, wherever God calls us in the days and weeks to come. Amen. Let's pray.